Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Gannett, and I want to start by thanking you for attending our, our webinar today. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, choosing the best Hobo water level loggers uh, for your applications. So um, let me get started. There we go. First, uh, this is for those that aren't able to uh, hear me. Hopefully this will give them some direction as to where to go to solve that problem. Just a couple logistics. So, shoot, okay. My click's not responding, so sorry for the little delays. Um, if you have questions at any time, feel free to enter them into the uh, questions uh, box in the control panel. Just click on that triangle and that will open up the questions panel where you can enter questions. And uh, some of the questions I may answer as we go along and some uh, we may save for the end. Um, so um, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to get to all of them. The webinar, I'm targeting about 60 minutes overall. I'm figuring about 40 minutes of uh, time for presentations and uh, about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes for questions. Uh, a lot of it depends upon how many questions I address during the presentation itself. So the webinar is being recorded and we'll make it available to all of you afterwards. So first off, I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, my name is Paul Gannett, and I'm product line manager for Onset's environmental products. I've been with Onset uh, for 24 years now. Uh, I live as well as work here on Cape Cod. And uh, I mentioned that because uh, Cape Cod is uh, covered with beautiful ponds, streams, estuaries, and we're surrounded by the ocean. And they are central to our economy as well as to our recreation. So uh, uh, protecting them and working with them uh, are deep in our DNA. So it also makes for some great uh, testing sites for, for trying out our loggers too, to, to prove them out in real, real uh, world applications. And uh, many of the other employees at Onset are also living and working uh, here on Cape Cod. And um, I've uh, had the pleasure of working with our engineering department to develop Onset's lines of uh, hobo data loggers and stations for outdoor and uh, water applications. And I add a note here in terms of, uh, we introduced our first water level loggers uh, back in 2005. So about, about 15 years ago that we've been uh, uh, selling those, supporting those, learning uh, how they're being used and as well as expanding our, uh, our line of offerings, which uh, leads to uh, what I'm gonna be talking about today. So first, I just told you a little bit about me. I wanna uh, find out a little bit more about uh, where you're coming from. So my first poll question is, is what types of water are you monitoring? And I think, um, my associate's gonna turn on that poll. Yep, the poll is open, great. And so here's the, um, uh, the choices, groundwater, streams, rivers, and lakes, coastal waters, canals, which can be like irrigation canals, for example, uh, stormwater systems, stormwater management, uh, even things like swales and uh, retention ponds might fit into that uh, category or other. If uh, if your application doesn't uh, fit into any of these uh, categories, just enter it into the uh, questions box uh, on your control panel and uh, I'll be able to see those. So we'll give um, another uh, couple, maybe uh, five seconds to uh, to get your answers in. So one, two, three, four, five, that's not five seconds. Okay, let's close out the poll and let's see the results. And Sorry, I'm doing this differently than I normally do it. And, oh, there they are. Okay, <laughs> I just had to open the right window. Okay, here's the results. 
59% uh, in groundwater. Uh, so that, that's more than half. Uh, streams, rivers, and lakes is the biggest category. Coastal, uh, like we have here on Cape Cod. Canals, a quarter. So pretty good distribution. Stormwater systems, you know, not as many there. So uh, so good. Okay, I think we've got something for everyone here. So we can close out of that and continue on to the next question. So this one is, uh, what is your application? You know, this is you know kind of a, you know tied to what we just talked about, but a little bit different to look at it. Are you doing watershed management, uh, stormwater management, flood management, or flood protection, environmental protection, irrigation? And again, if you've got uh, an application that fits into another category, enter that into the questions box as well. So. Oh, interesting. Uh, well, now it's evening out a little bit. We had one that was a clear winner, but now it's uh, evening out. So let's uh, still see him coming in. Okay, let's close it out. And there's the results. Why well, I said it was interesting is at one point, it was like 90% of you were doing environmental protection. Then uh, some of the, we got responses in other categories and kind of evened it out a little bit, but environmental protection is still the, the biggest category. So uh, that's that's good. Uh, we're all looking to uh, uh, better protect our environment as best we can. And uh, watershed management, uh, that's uh, kind of protecting our water resources, which is really important. Stormwater management, uh, kind of the other end of things when we got too much water let's f figure out what to do with it flood management again too much so uh and irrigation uh no good again again good distribution so so thank you for your responses there and i have one more question or one more poll for you and just to get your sense uh, give me a sense for what your experience is with water level loggers uh, have you used standalone water level loggers before? And if you don't know what I mean by that, we'll talk more about that during the presentation. Have you used remote water level loggers? Have you used any of our hobo water lo uh, loggers? Could be temperature loggers or water level loggers. And um, also, uh, you know, some of you may not have used data loggers before. So let's see uh, how this works out. Okay. Give me another couple seconds. Gives me a good sense. All right, okay, let's close it out, share the results. And about half of you have used standalone water level loggers. And about half of you have used hobo loggers, probably some overlap there as well. Uh, not as many have used uh, remote uh, uh, water level loggers or stations. And that's 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 kind of normal. It's, uh, it's kind of an up and coming area uh is is uh we're, we're making uh water level data more accessible through the internet and 42 uh, percent have never used data loggers okay great we've got uh, uh welcome to the world of data loggers welcome to the dark side hopefully uh, we'll make you feel more comfortable with choosing them and, and a little bit about using them as well so let's close that out so thanks for sharing that information about yourselves that uh that helps me and um so here's here's a quick overview. Whoops, my cat just walked in front of the screen. The joys of working from the home office. Um, yeah, first I'm gonna get, just give you a brief overview of um, what we have to offer. And then I'm gonna uh, get into, well, how do you choose? So which is the best for your application? And the two big questions are whether you need remote or not. And uh, if you don't need remote, whether you want self-contained or direct read. And then there'll be some time for uh, questions and answers at the, um, uh, at the end for questions that I don't get to during the presentation. Let's see. All right. So, um, so let me just kind of define my terms a little bit. Standalone loggers versus remote loggers and stations. The uh, standalone loggers are kind of what you, you think of when you first think of a data, uh, a water level data logger. Typically they're self-contained devices. 
that uh, you can kind of deploy in the water and they record the pressure or there's other t techniques as well, but uh, the ones we're going to be talking about here record the pressure of the water above it. And based on that, you can determine the water level changes over time. Um, in the range of self-contained loggers, we offer our U20 series of water level loggers and uh, they have uh, optical uh, communications uh, that allows them to be offloaded with uh, one of our base stations to a desktop or laptop computer or with our optional waterproof data shuttle. So this gives you a quick sense. Uh, direct read loggers are cabled loggers where you have a sensor that goes down into the water and then a logger at the top. And um, uh, you actually, you know, you read out the data from that logger at the top. In the case of our loggers, uh, they have Bluetooth communications so you can read them out wirelessly with uh, a mobile device such as your smartphone or an iPad. It makes them very convenient to use. Then, um, then our web-enabled uh, loggers over here, the remote loggers and stations. Uh, uh, what we sell are the RX stations. We've got a couple of different uh, families within that. I'll talk about those and differentiate between those, but uh, they, they get the data up to the internet uh, where you can access the data from wherever you happen to be, uh, including uh, on your mobile uh, phone. Uh, uh, so you can see, you know, really wherever you are, wherever you have uh, internet access. So getting into a little bit more detail uh, on what we have to offer in the standalone loggers, the self-contained loggers, we have U20 series. There's a couple sub-series within that. Uh, uh, the U20 metal housing uh, loggers are up top. Then we've got some that are in a uh, industrial grade plastic housings. That's the U20L series. Uh, there the uh, least expensive, starting at just below $300. And this is all U.S. dollars that I'm going to be talking in today. And um, the metal housing loggers range from $495 to $595, again, in U.S. dollars. Uh, direct read loggers um, uh, are a little bit more expensive, but they've got the convenient readout with mobile devices uh, without having to pull up the loggers. So we'll talk about the advantages of those. And then in terms of the remote loggers and stations, we have two um, RX series of, of stations. One is the micro RX stations, which are the uh, least expensive, uh, less expensive of the two options at uh, just over $1,000, including the sensor and cable. And then um, our RX 3000 stations, which have the most expandability, uh, give you the most um, uh, options uh, for adding additional sensors and expansion. Uh, they're a little bit more expensive, but uh, they're still pretty reasonably priced for a uh, remote water level station. So, big question for today is, what's the best for your application or applications? So, the first question is, do you need a web-enabled system for remote monitoring? And there's a lot of reasons that you might uh, need or want a web-enabled water level station. So, here's some of them. Uh, one is alarm notifications. Uh, this can tell you if critical water levels are reached, uh, you know, especially important in applications such as uh, flood warning, uh, notifications when you need to take samples, such if there's a storm event um, or you get a certain amount of flow, uh, you might want to go out in the field and take a, a sample at that point. Another advantage of alarm notifications is it's uh, gives you it gives you the option of getting notifications if there's any problems in your system so you can um, let's say there's a sensor uh, issue uh, we have with our stations we have system alarms it will tell you you've got a, a sensor error and that can send you an immediate alert that that's happened so you can go out and fix that issue before uh, you miss critical data so that that can be very important Um, it, of course, uh, because it's uh, web enabled, you can um, uh, easily view the data at any time uh, from wherever you are, from laptop, your phone, uh, desktop. This gives you a lot of options. You just have to log into your uh, Hobolink account and you can um, uh, view your data remotely. Uh, we've got some dashboard features so you can control uh, how you view, view your data. Uh, and then it can save you some time. Uh, uh, if you have to go to a site that's a couple hours drive away, 
uh, if you have the option to get that data remotely through the internet, it can save you a lot of time driving back and forth. Uh, it also allows you to more easily share data with others um, in terms of uh, you can have a, an account and you can set up uh, public access uh, features um, on the web account so that you can control how much data is shared with other users so they can get data that way and view your graphs that way. Um, and also being internet enabled, it allows um, you to integrate your, your systems into um, other uh, other systems you may have, you know, uh, for example, uh, the USGS um, uses uh, Aquarius as a, as a database management tool. Uh, you can easily integrate a internet-enabled system into Aquarius and and automatically get your data uh, through that as well. Um, another reason you might want a web-enabled system as you have other sensors uh, that you are have a need for other sensors such as rainfall which is quite common in uh, in flood warning applications uh, you can you can uh, easily add those into the station as well uh, we also with our um, web enabled systems we have the option for integrated conversion to water flow uh, so you can easily see how much uh, water is flowing through your streams and here's Another reason, it's just kind of fun to have your uh, data on the internet. You, you know, you're at a party with your friends. I guess no one, not many parties these days with the situation, but it, when you're able to go to parties, you could just uh, show them, hey, I can show you my site here, look at the water level data. It's, uh, I don't know, it's kind of fun. <laughs> and um, so here's some typical applications that uh, require remote monitoring. I got uh, the picture here, um, that's from uh, Petuna Aquaculture. It's an aquaculture application in Tasmania, Australia. I just think it's a cool place, so I wanted to include that picture there. They're looking at water levels as well as um, water flows. Um, but some other applications are flood warning, uh, where the alarm notifications are especially critical and the need for rainfall. Uh, dam management, that's something we're hearing a lot of, uh, where users, uh, uh, just want to, they've got, you've got networks of, of dams that are controlling the stream flows and water levels and ponds, and they need early notifications of potential problems. Wetlands, um, monitoring wetlands for either research purposes or for wetlands mitigation, uh, quite common. Uh, stormwater applications, uh, this is where getting notifications when you need to collect water samples can be important irrigation management. More and more we're seeing places where uh, it's required to monitor your water use and uh, so you can use a, a remote enabled stations for that. Um, yeah, aquaculture as I just mentioned and again locations that are hard to reach. So I got, uh, I'm just looking at the questions real briefly here. Um, yeah, I got a question on deployment. I'm going to save the deployment questions mounting for a little bit later. Just in, I want to give you a better sense for the loggers before we get into uh, uh, deployment. But that's a good, a good question. Oops. So now I'm going to talk specifically about the stations that uh, we have to offer, the Hobo Micro RX and the RX 3000 remote monitoring stations. So first I'm going to talk about some kind of common features to the stations. Uh, both of them uh, are web-enabled stations with ne uh, near real-time monitoring. The, um, uh, both of them support a 10-minute connection rate with cellular. And the RX3000 stations will support up to a one-minute connection rate with Wi-Fi or Ethernet uh, connections. Uh, both of them use non-vented ceramic water level sensors uh, for the best uh, reliability. Uh, multiple sensor ranges up to 76 meters. We have saltwater versions of the sensors that are uh, titanium and uh, uh, industrial-grade plastic housings. Uh, both of them have barometric sensors built into the station uh, for doing the barometric compensation for you know, deriving the water level data. 
and both of them have the option for the uh, the pre-programmed water flow formulas for common weirs, flumes, as well as um, options to enter stage discharge tables. They both have uh, inputs uh, for onset smart sensors for environmental parameters such as temperature, rain, and wind. And uh, data plans uh, for hourly connection intervals starting at $150 per year. When actually we have um, free data plans with our Wi-Fi and Ethernet options, I should mention that too. So continuing on with some of the common features, I mentioned the alarm notifications. The alarms within our stations are um, in-station alarms. So it's actually checking for uh, either water levels or um, temperatures, or depending on what alarms you set up, uh, uh, in the station itself. So let's say you, you're on a plan where you're only getting an hourly connection uh, normally for sending the data up to the internet. Well, if it detects in an alarm condition um, before the next hourly connection, uh, it's going to immediately uh, trigger a connection of the station to the internet so that you can get the alarm notification as soon as possible. Uh, you can set multiple levels of alarms. So you can have kind of your early warning uh, level alarm with, with uh, a set distribution list. And then you can have another uh, level where it gets a little bit higher. You get a little more concerned. You got to let uh, maybe some of the emergency response people know. So you can set you know, really, uh, I don't know what the limit, it's, uh, it's it, from a practical sense, it's uh, an unlimited uh, levels of alarms. And you can get notifications either by text messages or email. And if you're using the RX3000, uh, there's an option for a relay module, which can be used to turn something on, maybe trigger a sampler, for example. Um, as I mentioned before, there's the, um, the system alarm notifications. So those are the common features. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, kind of differences between the two stations. Uh, I hit on this briefly before, uh, but basically it's, you know, the micro RX is small and easy to deploy and most cost effective, while the RX 3000 is a little bit more uh, cost up front, but it's got the greatest expandability. Uh, in terms of communications, uh, they both have cellular communications, but the RX3000 also has the Wi-Fi and Ethernet options. In terms of power options, both of them have solar panel options. In the case of the Micro RX, the solar panel is built right in. With the RX3000, it's an external solar panel. Both have options for AC adapters. Uh, the Micro RX station also has an option uh, to be battery powered. It just runs off of um, uh, replaceable uh, lithium batteries, um, and uh, it can go you know, basically a year uh, with daily connections running off of those uh, internal uh, lithium batteries. The uh, micro RX station is limited to one water level state sensor per station, whereas the RX3000 can have two, uh, each requiring a module. There's two module slots within the RX3000 station. I'll show a picture of that in a couple slides. Uh, um, they both have smart sensor inputs, but the RX3000 has uh, five additional uh, inputs. Uh, the, uh, they both can accept analog sensors, but for the RX3000, it's a, a module that can go right inside the RX3000 uh, that can accept up to four analog uh, sensors. For the uh, micro RX, it requires an external closure, enclosure with adapters, a little more uh, complicated. So if you are using uh, uh, analog sensors, I'd recommend the RX3000. And uh, the other thing is that the RX3000 has the option for uh, connecting our Hoblinet environmental sensors. So these are sensors for things like uh, uh, wind and uh, temperature, RH, rainfall, soil moisture. And so you can have a whole network of wireless sensors coming into the RX3000 station in addition to monitoring water level at the station. As I mentioned, the RX3000 has an optional relay module. And then there's the pricing again. So the uh, just looking a little closer at the micro RX station, uh, it has integrated mounting tabs uh, for easy mounting with either zip ties or screws or 
Um, those are the primary ways that it's mounted, or U-bolts is the other way. Um, there's two models that we sell. Um, both include the integrated water level sensor input. Um, the one uh, that's battery powered is $640. The one with built-in solar is a little bit more. The uh, water level sensors and cables are purchased separately. The, the sensors are 350 or 400 if you're going for the saltwater version. And now switching gears to the RX 3000, the, the big brother. This um, has two module slots, so you can have up to two water level sensors coming into it. I think I've covered most of this, so I'm, I'm um, yeah, I think I'm going to just kind of uh, let you read it. And the main reason I have this slide is just so you can see what the inside looks like. It's got a nice little display, which helps with the troubleshooting. Uh, that display is also uh, available in the RX, uh, the Micro RX. Uh, so that helps with troubleshooting in both cases. Then some of the other sensors that can plug into the, um, the um, uh, smart sensor inputs. So you can see those there. And if you're using the RX3000, uh, that allows you to connect in a, a wide range of uh, analog output sensors, such as let's, uh, for water level, you might want to uh, might prefer to have an ultrasonic or a radar sensor which we do not uh, offer currently for our station at this time, but we do uh, have the analog inputs and we have you know, you know, many users that are, are connecting these other third party water level sensors into those analog inputs. And as I mentioned, we've got the integrated uh, flow calculation in uh, our Hobolink software, which is the um, uh, interface that you, you log into to access data that, um, uh, allows you to monitor flows and streams, rivers, sewers. You can see some you know, kind of examples of, you know, on the left there is a typical weir uh, monitoring uh, streams, or you can actually have weirs inside sewers as well um, for monitoring flow rates and sewers. The middle picture is a Palmer bolus uh, flume and uh, sewer system. So that's a pretty common way of measuring flows and sewers. And then uh, the stream where you might in that case, you might want to use the uh, stage discharge uh, table to enter um, the relationship between stream level and stream flow. And as I mentioned, uh, because it's internet enabled, you can share the data uh, easily uh, with other programs. We've got options for sending the data through FTP or email. Uh, you can set it in Excel formats or CSV formats, a lot of different choices and formats. So we have users that are using it in programs such as R and GIS modeling software. And then I show a couple of popular water data management platforms and flood management platforms down below, Aquarius and DataWise. Um, what's another one? Oh, Whiskey uh, is another popular one from a um, uh, German company, Keysters, that's it. So uh, keep uh, those are options as well. So that's been remote monitoring. But now if you say, well, I don't have quite the budget for remote monitoring, or I'm looking for something that's really small and self-contained, uh, then you want to be looking at our standalone loggers. So what are your choices there? Um, on the one side, uh, for self-contained loggers, we've got the Hobo U20 and U20L water level loggers. And I'll talk about those in more detail in a following slide, but both of them are really durable no signal cables uh, or connections uh, because they can be mounted on the bottom. They're the easiest to deploy and hide. And um, they are um, lower cost, um, starting at uh, $299. And typically, um, if you've got multiple uh, loggers in an area, uh, you only need one barometric logger within 10 miles uh, of, the, um, of, of the loggers. Uh, to record barometric pressure, that's typically enough. You know, some some people even will stretch that to 20, you know, 20 miles, but uh, we typically say 10 miles is, is good. And um, so that, that one barometric logger can be shared between multiple loggers that are in the water. And um, another thing that's kind of important to keep in mind is the U20 loggers are part of our 
uh, Hobo Optic USB family of loggers. So if you also need temperature, light, DO, or conductivity, or salinity measurements, um, this is you know these are good ones to look at for standalone loggers. And we also have our Hobo MX 2001 uh, direct read loggers. They're um, uh, uh, they're the ones that you read out with uh, Bluetooth communications to your mobile devices. Um, uh, that saves you can save you a lot of time from uh, avoiding having to pull up loggers from the water. Um, and we have other models that are within uh, that family for temperature, light, and pH. So that could be a factor too if those are other parameters you want to measure. So just a little bit more details. Um, the best accuracy in the standalone loggers is the U20 series, which come in either stainless steel or titanium housings. Uh, we uh, specify those as 0.05% typical accuracy, which for the 13-foot uh, range is 0.01 uh, uh, foot, uh, eighth of an inch roughly, uh, accuracy. Um, and those range, well, 495 and 595. Another reason that people often uh, choose the, uh, the metal housing uh, U20 loggers is that they are slightly less than one inch in diameter, so it can fit in those uh, one inch wells. Um, on the other side, we've got the U20 L series loggers, which are, I think are an inch and a quarter, so they're slightly bigger, uh, but uh, they're still very robust, great price point. And we spec the accuracy a little, not quite as good as the um, the metal housing loggers, just uh, to account for the, you know, the, 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 the greater tolerance variation in the, the plastic housing. But there's still pretty good accuracy in most cases. So both of these uh, series uh, of loggers are self-contained, non-vented loggers. Uh, they both use the same optic USB interface. They do uh, require different couplers into our base stations and, and waterproof shuttles. Um, and they, they both are compatible with a waterproof shuttle for um, uh, easy offload in the field. They both have the same uh, ceramic sensors. Um, the, the metal ones are rated up to 76 meters. The, uh, the, plast uh, the, the U20L series are only rated up to 100 feet. And uh, the software that you use with them is the our Hoboware software, which is for um, uh, running on desktop and laptop uh, computers. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple slides. So the um, uh, base stations operate like this. You plug it into the, the coupler, the appropriate coupler for the logger, and uh, offload the data either t directly to your laptop or desktop uh, computer or you can use our Hobo Waterproof Data Shuttle, which is very popular. To, because these loggers are just recording the absolute uh, pressure of the water, you have to do barometric compensation. So you need to bring in data from a, another logger, a barometric pressure logger. And this is um, the screen in our software, we call it our Barometric Compensation Assistant, which allows you to uh, enter the, the uh, type of water you're in, uh, be it uh, freshwater, salt water, that helps determine the density. And, it, and I did get a question beforehand um, about how important is it to compensate for the type of water you're in, and, and it does make a difference. So if um, you're, uh, it makes, makes a difference of about 2.5 percent. So I did the math on that, and if you're measuring uh, water that's 12 feet deep. Uh, that 2.5% difference can make a difference of four inches. So you do wanna, uh, that's between if it was pure fresh versus pure uh, salt water. So you do wanna uh, make sure that you match the type of water you're using as best as possible here. Now, if you've got a mix of fresh and uh, uh, salt water, you'd wanna choose the, uh, the brackish water um, as just kind of your best compromise there. Um, also, uh, you get the chance to enter in a reference water level here. Uh, this not only allows you to adjust your data to, to 
whatever reference point you're using, such as maybe you're looking at your water level relative to mean sea level, you can enter in the elevation uh, at the start of your deployment versus mean sea level. It also does your calibration, um, so that if if your sensor has drifted over the years, this this is a way of calibrating out that drift. And then our software does the magic. The Hubbleware software does the magic of calculating water level. So and it also uh, can be used for doing graphing and analysis. Does data export? You can save the data as a project file, um, so you can add data to it in the future, do future analysis, and it runs on either Windows or Mac uh, platforms. So, some typical applications, hydrology, estuaries, stream restorations, storm surge mapping. Uh, the U USGS uses many of our water level loggers, as you can see, uh, how they, they mount them in a very durable uh, housing uh, to anything that they don't think is going to get knocked over by the, uh, uh, the the hurricane storm surges so they can get a, a better map of where the um, the potential for you know, damage is uh, from, from uh, hurricane storm surges. Now, um, uh, switching over to our um, direct read loggers, the Hobo MX2001 water level loggers with the Bluetooth readout. Um, they have uh, easy readout uh, using uh, Bluetooth uh, to your mobile device. Uh, and in many cases, it means you don't even need to remove the well cap. If it's a plastic well cap or if it's in a um, uh, BVC pipe, uh, the wireless signals will go right through that. So it makes it very easy to read the data out um, uh, while it remains in the, in the well. Uh, the logger does include a barometric pressure sensor in the head, so you don't need a second logger for barometric compensation. And it also means you can read the data out directly in water level, no need for post-processing of the data. And that means that just as you walk up to it, you can see the current water levels in your well, which is pretty handy. And again, we sell saltwater versions uh, with uh, uh, the titanium. Um, and they start at uh, 595 for the uh, a set of the logger and the sensor, and then you add the cable on on top of that. The software for these that runs on your mobile devices is, is uh, Hobo Mobile. Uh, actually, I should update this slide. We, uh, sorry about that. We we are uh, we've repackaged it as uh, Hobo Connect. Um, so uh, my my bad for not updating that. Um, and we have versions of that that run on iOS and Android devices. And um, uh, again, it makes it very easy to share the data, different platforms via uh, email, uh, basically any um, uh, text messaging, anything that you have on your mobile device for uh, sharing files and sending programs you can use to share your um, uh, you know, data files. And it does have an option for automatically uploading the data to HoboLink. This is the same HoboLink that you can uh, use with the RX stations that I talked about before. So it becomes a, a central repository uh, for um, all of your data, both your MX data as well as your um, uh, RX data. So it makes it very convenient to have all your data in one place. And this software, the Hobo Connect software, is a free download. Um, got another good question here on uh, mounting. I'm gonna I'm gonna save the mounting questions, kind of deal with them all uh, all together. So uh, the wireless readout. One of the advantages of that is that you don't have to be right at the well to offload the data. It has about uh, a hundred foot range if it's a line of sight between the the, the well and where you're trying to read out the data, which is handy in an application like this where you don't want to have to walk into the um, salt marsh to uh, offload the data to get you know to get to the well. You can be walking on these uh, walkways and still get access to your water level data uh, very easily. Um, some typical applications for the MX2001 loggers are wetlands, uh, again, because it um, allows you to get your data without having to necessarily go out into the middle of your, your wetland. 
water use monitoring they're popular for because it just provides a nice convenient way of um, where, you know, offloading the data with your phone. And, and one of the advantages, too, of being able to uh, use the software on your, your mobile devices, if you have an associate that you want to retrieve the data for you, you just, you just tell them to go download the, uh, the free app, uh, download it with his phone, and then he can send you the files so that um, uh, if you can't make it out to the site, uh, it's very easy for somebody else to retrieve the data. And there is an option to set a password protection on that so that not just anybody can walk up to the uh, uh, to your data logger and offload the data. But it's nice to have that option to um, uh, be able to have others download uh, data for you. Um, 2001s are also popular with stormwater management. Uh, just keep in mind that if you've got uh, a big metal manhole cover over your uh, uh, storm sewers, the, the wireless may not go through that. You might have to open that up. Um, there are some composite uh, manhole covers that make it a little bit easier to, to uh, offload the data wirelessly. So just keep that in mind. I'm just in, I had this poll question in here, but I'm actually going to skip over it because just in the interest of time, we're a little, a little tight on time. I've, I've been a little longer winded than I planned on. So let me just skip this for right now. I do want to talk, um, and this is starting to get into the deployment uh, area, is uh, which I know a couple of you had questions on, is, um, uh, but first I want to talk about selecting the um, the right depth range for your sensor. And I think most of you guys have this figured out, but basically figure out what your, your maximum water level is uh, relative to where the, your uh, uh, logger is going to be deployed. You want to make sure to put your water level logger so that it's going to be completely submerged at the lowest water level if, if possible. Now, I know sometimes that's hard. Like if you're measuring in the storm sewer, maybe the best you're going to be able to do is just get the, the very bottom of the water level sensor into the um, down to the bottom of the, of the storm sewer. And that's, that's okay. It just means that you won't be able to measure that, you know, that half an inch at the bottom. But um, um, generally you want to try to have it below the, the lowest water level and then you just figure out okay what's the distance between that lowest water level and the maximum water level and uh, that tells you what a range water level sensor you need and that applies to any of the types of water level loggers that we've been talking about the standalone loggers or the the web enabled uh, stations and um, another thing to keep in mind is if you're deploying it on the bottom of a reservoir or a stream, um, you know, keep in mind that you've, you've, you're going to be putting it on the bottom so that it's out of the way of boat traffic or whatever. And so you need to account for the, the maximum depth of that lake or stream above the, uh, uh, the water level logger. Make sure you've got enough depth range so you don't exceed the, the maximum depth range for measurement. So this is actually a good time. I had a couple questions here on, on mounting. So I'm just going to uh, read this one. Uh, is uh, sediment following for the sensors in high turbidity water something to be concerned about? If so, are there ways to address that? And um, yeah, that is, uh, as you can see in this uh, application photo here, uh, uh, there's a fair amount of sediment in that stream. and and um, you know that is something that you have to be careful about. It's you don't want the holes in the logger uh, to get clogged, or the or, or in the sensor, I should broaden it to that. So you don't want the holes in the sensor or logger to get clogged with sediment. So um, if it's a, if it's a high sediment environment, typically what I recommend is putting it in a slotted uh, PVC uh, pipe. And those have very fine slits on them, like razor slits. So they don't allow most of the sediment to get through the pipe, but they allow the water to get through the pipe. And so that's a good approach there. Sometimes we have people mounting their um, uh, uh, their sensors or loggers uh, wrapped in uh, landscape fabric, which again is a very fine mesh that helps keep that sediment out there. So. Um, uh, those are a couple options, so it's a lot of PVC or landscape mesh. 
Let's see. So here's another one that's kind of related to this. Uh, how would you deploy a data logger within a stream or river to monitor for overbank flow flood events? Um, yeah, this is getting a little trickier. Um, and the housing for logger stream well, Yeah. Yeah, certainly in stream environments, especially if they're going to be overflowing their banks, you um, you know you need to have a, a pretty uh, wide uh, range of accessibility. Um, you know, one option in those cases is to um, have a uh, stilling well that goes down the side of your uh, stream embankment um, if it's a fairly continuous uh, slope to the stream embankment and that allows you to lower the water level logger or, or sensor down to the bottom of the stream so that it's always going to be submerged but you know still have access uh, for a station at the, at the top or a way of pulling up the logger even in the um, uh, in the stream overflow advance it, it may require a long uh, PVC pipe to be able to do that because of the you know, you're not going straight up and down but in terms of the sensors or the loggers, they don't care if they're horizontally or mounted at an angle because they're just measuring pressure. So what they are really just measuring is the, um, the pressure of the water above it. So they're very flexible in terms of how they can be mounted. So hopefully I get, you know, I'm, I'm just touching on the subject there. It's not a, a full uh, uh, um, explanation. We do have some other webinars on our website, I should mention, uh, they go into more details on, on mounting approaches uh, for mounting water level loggers. So you might want to look those up. Sorry. Oops. My computer was responding a little slow. So here we go. Okay. Um, so this is my recap slide. So it's, uh, I think this is the same as I showed you before. So we've talked about standalone loggers. Uh, with the standalone loggers, we have the self-contained uh, U20 series and U20L series. And then within, uh, we have the direct read loggers, the MX2001 series. And uh, then uh, for remote uh, applications where you want to get your data from anywhere through the internet, um, we have the micro RX and the RX3000 station. So, that uh, I went a little over, like I said. Um, now I have about 10 minutes for some uh, questions and answers. Let's Hi, Paul. See. Hey. Hey, Jessica. Hey, we did have a, a couple questions earlier on. Um, if you wouldn't mind addressing those. Um, what is yeah. the best water level data logger for water flow monitoring in sewers? Yeah, um, good question. And um, yeah, you're going to need one with a fairly narrow range uh, for sewers because of the fact that uh, you, usually it's pretty um, uh, low flows. They're not, they're not very deep. So you want to use one uh, that's got a, the 13 foot or four meter range so you get the best accuracy. And um, a big question still comes down to whether you want remote access or or not. So it's a lot of the same uh, thought process that I outlined. It's, you know, first ask yourself whether you want remote uh, monitoring or just a standalone logger. And then if, if you, uh, it, and a lot of that depends upon whether you need, uh, you know, instant uh, current results or alarming or if you just uh, can make do with historical information that you get from a standalone logger so that's uh, that's the same basic question that you would uh, want to ask yourselves there and then uh, for convenient offload i would tend to recommend the mx2001 loggers just because uh, you can offload those wirelessly you don't have to, to climb it down into your storm sewers to uh, to pull up the data loggers and uh, just makes it a little bit uh, neater and easier. So that, that'd be my general thoughts. So Great. thanks for that question. What thanks. else? We have uh, kind of along the same line, but uh, recommendations for the best water level data logger for shallow ground water wells. Yeah. 
Yeah, another good question, and 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 uh, I'm going to sound like a broken record here. It's basically the same same thing. You got to ask yourself: Are you looking to uh, get real time conditions? If you're looking at shallow groundwater levels, it sounds a little bit more like a hydrology study. So you might be um, more interested in the standalone loggers, where you're you're going to have multiple ones deployed, and then you're going to feed them into some sort of um, Hydrology modeling software. Um, so you want you, uh, uh, the standalone loggers may be your best option. Either one of our standalone loggers is going to be able to uh, easily uh, export data in a format that you can bring into your modeling software. Uh, if it's a really shallow well, you might need to uh, use our uh, U20 series loggers just because they're smaller and they can fit in a. Uh, uh, a, a shallower well. You need a little bit more headspace for the uh, MX2001 water level loggers. So that's another factor to keep in mind. It's just how much uh, you know, room you have in your well for mounting the logger. So, okay, what great. Else? Thank you. Um, do you have water level sensors compatible with SDI 12? Oh, yeah, that's a question. We, we get that question especially from our good friends at the USGS um, because a lot of the stations uh, deployed in, the, in those networks are uh, SDI-12 based uh, stations and uh, we do not have uh, water level sensors that have an SDI-12 uh, type output. So really uh, the, the sensors that we sell uh, are ones that are uh, designed for use with our uh, RX station. So uh, that's uh, you kind of you, you kind of um, uh, it makes it easier to deploy them because everything's integrated. But yeah, it does give you a little less flexibility to tie into existing stations that you might already have. We try to make our stations, you know, cost effective, you know, fairly cost effective. So if you need to add another, you know, station to accommodate our uh, water level sensors. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's usually not too bad an investment to do that. Great, thank you. Um, another question here from Keith. If the data logger becomes dry when the water table drops below the monitoring elevation, does this affect accuracy? Yeah, that's a good, a good question. And that is, um, the answer is uh, 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 no, it does not affect the accuracy. The, it's a pressure-based uh, measurement and um, the sensors uh, that we use are very durable ceramic sensors, so they don't they don't get bothered at all uh, by being dry. And we have a lot of uh, well, a fair number of users that are using them like in tidal areas where at low tide, you know, the sensor is high and dry. Uh, we have people using them in um, uh, vernal pools where it's only uh, wet certain times. Same with storm sewers. Uh, quite often, they're only uh, you have water flowing them uh, in them at certain times, and and uh, so these are very common applications where the um, uh, sensor is only submerged part of the time, and you just have to be careful in those kind of applications to to carefully note what the elevation of the sensor is. And we have you know diagrams which will tell you uh, exactly where the sensor is, so you can um, you know factor that into your your water uh, depth calculations. Okay, great, thanks. Um, a question from Troy now. Uh, can you read 420 and pulse for pressure and flow with one one unit? Okay, yeah, 420, I think that's referring to 4 to 20 um, current loops. Yeah, our analog input module will accept uh, sensors that uh, have 4 to 20 milliamp outputs, such as uh, you know flow sensors. It's a pretty common uh, signal for uh, flow sensors. Um, so yeah, you can uh, integrate those sensors pretty easily. And the station has a certain amount of power for, for doing loop powering of those uh, loop powered sensors. So quite often, it's um, there's no need for an external power supply for those sensors. And for flow with pulse output sensors, we also have pulse input adapters. So, uh, so if you've got a pulse output sensor, yeah, you can hook those into the the system as well. In that case, I would recommend using our RX three thousand 
station for the um, the analog inputs. It's it, the integration is going to be easiest for you. If you're using sensors with pulse outputs, those can be attached either to the micro RX or the uh, RX 3000 station. So either one of those is a good choice uh, for those sensors. Okay, great. Thanks, Paul. A lot of, lot of questions um, coming in now. A couple more on recommendations for data loggers. There's one here. Um, what would you recommend for uh, large, um, mighty, presumably fast-flowing rivers um, greater than 20 meters or more? Yeah, it's um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, for big rivers, yeah, you you got to have um, you can either have a stilling well uh, in the in the river. A lot of times for those uh, bigger bodies of water, and, and even in smaller bodies of water, instead of having the water level sensor right in the flow, is that they will have a um, stilling well off to the side of the river, which has a uh, a pipe that connects it to the river. That way. Uh, the the instrumentation is protected from the flow. It's not interfering with the flow, and it's um, the um, the water level in that that stilling well uh, off to the side of the river or stream uh, mimics the river uh, level. Uh, uh, in in your instrumentations, your water level loggers uh, can be deployed in that that stilling well off to the side of the river. So that's that's typically what I would recommend there for those kind of big flow waters. The other choice, of course, is to use a stage discharge curve. This is if you want to get flow um, to um, uh, characterize flow versus uh, water level for that stream. But that, that's that's only if you're looking for flow, that you, you'd uh, uh, use that approach. So hopefully that gives you some clues there. Again, you, you can uh, refer to our um, uh, water level uh, logger deployment uh, webinar that's also available on our website. Great, thanks Paul. Um, we have a question from Mitchell asking us specifically about the micro RX station, um, but uh, it's asking whether there's an option um, to measure salinity with the micro RX or would it, would, um, would it be another option? Yeah, no, that's uh, that's a good question. For we don't sell at this point a salinity sensor that can be interfaced directly to the uh, to the Mar micro RX station. So what I'd recommend in that case is actually using our, our RX three thousand station, which has uh, that analog module option, and using a third party uh, salinity sensor uh, connected to that um, that analog module. There's, uh, there's, you know, there's uh, a few vendors out there that make some good uh, salinity sensors that could be, uh, you know, with like a four to 20 milliamp uh, interface tied into the RX 3000. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, there's a couple additional questions here on de deployment, um, but we're we're at the top of the hour now. Do you want to go a minute or two over, or shall we follow up with? Yeah, let's take one more, and then um, then maybe we'll we'll uh, uh, kind of kind of sign out, out of, you know, and uh, we'll follow up uh, with uh, f on the questions we weren't able to get to. Sounds good. Um, this is Mitchell again. He's asking um, about mounting the micro RX in a shallow groundwater well, um, and it's constructed of of PVC. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, good, uh, good question again. The micro RX is, uh, it's, it's pretty light. So if you've got a PVC stilling well, it's, it's, you're using for groundwater, uh, measurements, um, uh, I'd, I'd mount the, uh, the micro RX right on the outside of that well. It's, it's, uh, it's light enough. It's, it's not going to make a tip over or anything. It's going to be, be very stable mounted on that. You can mount it with zip ties. It's probably the easiest way to do it. And, um, uh, you might need to put some little bit of tape on the the PVC to keep the uh, it from sliding down. Sometimes the PVC pipe can be a little slippery. And what was the other thing? Oh, uh, we sell a well cap uh, that can go on top of the well that allows the cable to pass through 
uh, to the micro RX station. So definitely want to uh, buy that version of our, our well cap to, to use that application. So, okay, fantastic. All right. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, well, thank you, Jessica, for reading those questions. Um, another resource we have for uh, finding out information is our, our website. We we, uh, we put a lot of great information out there, including uh, webinar recordings from past webinars we've offered. All of our pricing and uh, specifications are up on our website. We've got application stories, tutorials, some self-guided trainings. And if that isn't enough information, we've also uh, you can send us an email uh, to one of our application specialists or tech support questions. Can uh, We have a form, a web-based form for uh, submitting your technical support questions. We encourage you to use that form. And just to wrap things up, I, I really want to thank you all for attending our webinar today. Hopefully it's been useful for you. And um, before you go, I do want to ask that you uh, share your feedback. We want to keep trying to make these uh, webinars uh, as useful as possible for you. So if there's other topics you'd like to see us cover, make a note of that uh, there. And, um, and also let us know if you'd uh, like us to follow up with any uh, particular questions. We'd be happy to, to follow up on your more detailed, uh, specific questions. So thanks again and have a great day, everyone.